Hey, how goes it? Ken Bozak from the BitcoinPodcast.com here to talk about Bitcoin and Bitcoin accessories. And today we're here to talk about the Bitcoin PHL meetup that takes place in Philadelphia, PA. Now this Bitcoin meetup is sponsored by the BitcoinPodcast.com, Athena Bitcoin, the BTC Nation, and Swarm.City. We had two amazing guest speakers at this meetup. Jack Tater, he spoke about Bitcoin as an investment vehicle, and you can get some some great advice on how to invest in Bitcoin and and basically any invest in anything. It's just straight up uh, investment advice that you can implement into investing in Bitcoin. So thank you, Jack Tater. Um, you're going to learn a little bit about Lawnmower.io and a little bit about Get Gems. These are some of Jack Tater's uh, investments. They are applications that deal with Bitcoin. So definitely want to go ahead and check that out. There is going to be links in the description below. So you can go ahead and check out Jack Tater's book, What's the Deal with Bitcoins? The first book written about Bitcoins. So go ahead and check out the description box below for links to that. Shout out to Luciana Valdez from Swarm.City. He also spoke at this meetup. Um, so if you enjoy this, please go ahead and hit me with a thumbs up. For any reason whatsoever, if you dislike this video, go ahead and shoot it a thumbs down. Please leave a comment in the comment section below and share this video with your friends. Please subscribe and hit the alert bell right next to subscribe so you don't miss any of my videos because I do like to give Bitcoin away at the end of my videos. All right, well, that's basically pretty much it. I'm going to go ahead and just wrap it up and it's going to go ahead right to the meetup. So thank you and have a day. Hey everyone, uh, I think we'll get started now. All right, so to those of you who haven't met me, um, I'm Nate. Um, I'm from the Ten Fifteen and Blockchain Club here. Um, so most of you guys are from the uh, Philadelphia Bitcoin Meetup. Um, we're super excited to have you guys here. Um, uh, our goal, one of our goals, was to kind of get more involved with the community, and that's that's part of this. Um, so um, we're super happy to have you. We've got a fantastic speaker. I'm gonna let Ryan talk a little bit more about that. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about our club or what we're doing, feel free to uh, talk to me or Matt here. Um, we'd love to talk to you guys. Um, thanks so much for coming. Cool. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. So first off, by a show of hands, could you just uh, raise your hand if you're from the Penn community? And then could you raise your hand if you're just from the greater Philadelphia community? Cool. So it looks like we got about 60, 40 or so. And it's just so awesome to have uh, this event. We've been holding our meetups at 30th Street Station and we're just thrilled to partner with you guys to have this beautiful venue and uh, kind of bring together some of the folks in the city who are interested in Bitcoin. By show of hands also, does anyone here like just completely new to Bitcoin doesn't really know much at all about Bitcoin or blockchain? Awesome. So just some basic background. Uh, Bitcoin really has been around now for uh, eight years and it's the culmination of over 40 years of research in computer science. Whenever you hear about something getting hacked, that's a Bitcoin exchange getting hacked, not the Bitcoin network. And it's essentially applying world-class cryptography to a distributed computer network. And as a result of that, you have this new magical currency that you can get rich off of. So we're, you know, our speaker today is Jack Tater. And Jack is actually one of the first authors in the world to have ever written about Bitcoin. He wrote the first book about Bitcoin in 2013 called What's the Deal with Bitcoins? And he's also been involved with a few really exciting projects in the space from Lawnmower, uh, which is a investment app around altcoins that are recently acquired by Coindesk to uh, get gems which Jack will be talking a bit more about tonight. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome Jack Tater. Oh. <laughs> Had a schedule there, yeah. kind of. Look at that. Thank you so much, everyone. I always, like, I always like being involved in Bitcoin conferences and meetings because I'm always the old guy in the crowd. <laughs> so uh, it's, good to, it's good to see everyone here. When uh, we originally talked about doing this, I know that Ken had highlighted the fact that we were going to talk about uh, Get Gems and Lawnmower, which are two companies that I've been involved in as an angel investor. One has just recently been acquired, as Brian mentioned. I'm going to get to that as well. 
But we also thought, since today, Bitcoin reached its all-time high in value, above 1,100. I don't know what it closed. But, well, it doesn't close, actually. It's 24 hours a day. Uh, but I think, it was over, I think it was about 1140 when I checked the last time of Bitcoin, which is pretty cool given the fact that years ago, someone bought a couple of pizzas for how many, how many Bitcoins was that, Ken? 10,000. 10,000. Right, the most expensive pizza ever, ever purchased. But that's going back into history. I appreciate Ryan's kind words uh, about my involvement with Bitcoin. What I wanted to do tonight was obviously talk about some of those businesses, as I mentioned. But I also wanted to talk about the investment potential with Bitcoin and blockchain assets, which is not the only thing that Bitcoin is all about. Okay, Bitcoin is about a lot more than that. But it's my feeling that as it matures as an investment option for people, and as blockchain assets come out as an investment option, that there'll be more activity in the space. And I think you'll see more involvement there uh, as well. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit to actually the, uh, the early 1990s. And it was right after my wife and I got married, and we had just actually bought our first house. And I remember she came home from work one day, and she said, we need to find out about this thing called the internet. And I said, okay, haven't heard about it, let's we'll check it out. Fortunately, I was an adjunct professor at a school upstate, and I went into the library, and I was able to get an account, and I started playing with Mosaic. I don't know if anybody, you guys know what Mosaic was. Mosaic was a predecessor of Netscape and browsers and whatnot. I got involved with it and uh, started to also get involved from an investment standpoint. And it's the old saying, you make a fortune and you lose a fortune. And that's pretty much what I did with internet stocks. I was a speculator. I was going in and buying them. I remember one time I made $90,000 on a stock called SkyMall. You guys know what SkyMall is? You take the, you take the uh, airplane and it's a magazine that's in there. They announced one day that they were going to have a website, and the stock shot up. It was that type of market. It was insane. It was crazy. So as I said, I made a fortune, but I also lost a fortune. And what I learned from this was it's not just about speculating. It's about being able to understand investment philosophy, portfolio creation, and asset allocation. I know it sounds like real boring stuff, but it actually ends up paying off. So I'm not going to get too far into that, but the reason I'm bringing that up is because right now I'm working on a book. It's scheduled for a release at the end of the summer, and it's going to be called Blockchain Assets. I'm writing with another gentleman by the name of Chris Bernisky, uh, who is actually a lead analyst with an investment firm. He writes a lot uh, on, the, uh, on Bitcoin and blockchain assets. And what we're doing is we're focusing in on Bitcoin and blockchain assets and their investment characteristics. So it's not just about watching Bitcoin going up to $1,000 and saying, I've got to make money on this, but to understand it as an investment as well and put a lot of the portfolio tools and a lot of the investment theories that are out there to this so that you just don't run into what we ran into at the dot-com, where it's like, I made a lot of money, and then the next day you wake up and it's like, where did it go? Okay, so there are ways to do this. Fortunately, you guys are all young out there, so you can kind of, uh, you have a little bit of time to make and lose some money, I guess. But let me go into this presentation here. So who am I? Uh, as Ryan mentioned, I authored this book, What's the Deal with Bitcoins? What I've soon learned is there actually is no such word as Bitcoins. Okay? It's, it's Bitcoin is singular, and Bitcoin is plural. Okay? So I've learned that over the years. So when I put that up there, people immediately think, this guy's totally discredited because there is no such thing as Bitcoin. It was a long time ago, and we actually got into it because the gentleman who was an intern for me, Ryan Lancelot, I said to him one day, I said, we've got to find out about this thing called Bitcoin. And he went and he did a research study on it. Uh, he was actually a student who was interned with me, and he came back to me and gave me a 60-page report on Bitcoin. And I said, you know what? I'm going to turn this into a book. And he and I 
got together. We wrote a book together, and it's one of the first books. And I'm going to tell you how you can get a free copy of it at the end of this talk. Uh, I also have a research business. I also uh, have a media company. Uh, I've done a lot of writing on Bitcoin. I write for bitcoin.about.com. And I'm actually a certified digital currency expert. You guys didn't even know that that was a thing. Uh, it was actually a thing with the Digital Currency Council. They had a uh, program to do it. So I have that. You know, it, it, it's, it, I get to put it up here. That's about it. But I actually did learn a lot. And then the last part, which I'm going to talk about, is I have been an angel investor, an early stage investor for a number of businesses, and I'm also an advisor to a number of Bitcoin and blockchain startups. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk today about uh, Lawnmower, which just got purchased by Coindesk, Get Gems, which is an application that is kind of orphaned out there. Uh, I think there's an opportunity for people who may be looking for an opportunity to get involved with something. And then Metal Pay, which is actually something that my buddy Ryan Strauss turned me on to, which is actually going to be a payment process, and they're specifically focusing in on legal cannabis shops. So uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I don't get burnt on that investment. Uh, sorry. <laughs> you got that? I know, my joke's not that great. Right. Back, in, back in 2013, I wrote a series of articles. As I mentioned, I got into the investment uh, area, and I actually write and have written with marketwatch.com. So anyone know marketwatch.com? It's a finance site. At the time, I was writing, uh, and I've written a few books on finance and specifically retirement. At the time, I started to think, when you look at your investment portfolio, what do you normally invest in? Stocks, bonds? And there's this other category which is known as alternative investments. If you've noticed, it's a category that's been growing more and more over the years. So people can put 5 to 10% of their investment portfolio into that. So my thinking was, why not use Bitcoin for the alternative investments? And that's what I did. And I actually went out and wrote a series of articles over, over about two and a half years saying, I'm going to invest in my retirement account in Bitcoin. And I invested $25,000 of my own money in that, in that account. And I followed it. And you can, you can notice that I got a lot of support from my readers. You know, uh, I don't think I was called a jerk or a moron as much as I was in these articles. So the series of articles went on for a while. In fact, I, I'm not sure that this was the real Ted Turner, but I did get called stupid by a Ted Turner. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and I love the other one, Jack Tater saying ta-ta to his money. But there were, there were 200 comments every time I wrote an article. And the one thing that people kept saying was, Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. Have you guys heard that? You guys yes. been involved in Bitcoin? Yeah. It, it's probably the dumbest analogy I've ever heard. There's no way it could be a Ponzi scheme, but that's a, whole nother, that's a whole nother talk. So I wrote this over a series of years, and I actually, at one point, wrote an article that was called How I Lost Half of My Retirement Investment in Bitcoins. My $25,000 went down to twelve and a half thousand dollars at one point in 2014. Does anyone remember, for those of you who've been involved, yeah. that big drop? Well, what was interesting is, is if I was a big investment person, then I should have gotten out if I would lose 50%, right? There's, there's a little bit of advice for you. If, you. if your investment's down 50%, probably get the hell out. I couldn't get out because I was in a trust investment. It wasn't a publicly traded investment. It was something I had to go in as an accredited investor. And I had to hold on to the investment for one year. So I was locked into that investment. It's kind of like a hedge fund. You guys are familiar with hedge funds? I couldn't get out of the investment. So I had to watch it go down halfway. And I wrote an article. I lost half of my investment. And the people loved it. They were like, ah, this guy is really a moron, whatever. Uh, ultimately, in 2015, it went back up and beyond the 25000 Dollars and of course I didn't get the comments then uh, after writing about that. So let me come back. Let me come back to this whole concept I had about putting Bitcoin into my portfolio as an alternative investment. I know this is a little confusing, and I'm going to show you a number of charts because I'm going to try and apply what you would do as an investor with anything: stocks, bonds, whatever. A lot of the tools of technical analysis. I'm going to go over that, and I think you're going to find that it can, it can help you out even if you're just a small investor looking at Bitcoin. But here's a breakdown 
these different things. I took a look at the NASDAQ, the Russell 2000, Dow Jones, and the black line is alternatives. And if you see alternatives, they're not that great of an investment, but they're pretty steady. Okay? And alternative investments are typically non-correlated holdings. People know what is meant by non-correlated? So in other words, if the stock market goes up, alternatives don't do anything. If the stock market goes down, alternatives don't do anything as well. So it's kind of a protective uh, buffer in your portfolio. You don't put a lot into it. Typically, what p people see as alternatives can range from uh, real estate to commodities to currencies. And here's something to took a look at. This was a uh, allocation that Bloomberg had done uh, about an investment sample portfolio that mixed a lot of different alternatives in there. And we actually pulled out of this 2.5% of it and, and just put the Bloomberg Bitcoin index. So we, in essence, put Bitcoin into this portfolio and pulled out some of the alternatives. And if you notice, we actually got some higher returns there, just by a small percentage of putting Bitcoin into the investment. If you notice, if you consider Bitcoin as a currency, it was actually the top performing currency of 2013, the worst performing currency of 2014. So we got some volatility there, and that was when I lost, all of, lost that money uh, on paper, not in reality. Uh, and, you know, of course, they've got their little emoticon there. Whoever came up with that one is a genius. Uh, and then 2015 and 2016, it was the highest performing currency out there. So if you look at it just as a currency, you know, like the dollar or like the Australian dollar or any type of currency, it has performed well. But you can also see where the fluctuation has been. And that is kind of a criticism of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a very, has been historically a very volatile asset. So you see it here, I mean, look at the price increases. Look at how it's gone, look at how it's gone. Now, as we get closer to 2016, where it's starting to find more usage and people are getting more comfortable with it, what do we find? We find the volatility of Bitcoin has now gone down to the point of it's actually less volatile than gold. So it has less volatility than gold. The investment that I went into uh, with my retirement account, which is something that everyone can buy today, is an investment called GBTC. Anyone familiar with GBTC? Okay, GBTC, actually, uh, it began as that investment trust. Remember I told you I couldn't sell it for a year? After that one year was over, it then could sell on the exchange. It's sold on the OTCQS, QX exchange. Uh, it was put out by uh, Digital Currency Group, Barry Silbert, who's a big venture capitalist, and basically it's one-tenth the price of Bitcoin. So it looks like an ETF. It is not a legally official SEC-regulated ETF. There is none right now. I'll talk a little bit about that. But it kind of functions as an ETF. If you had 10 of them, the price should be the price of one Bitcoin. So when you look at this, because it trades on the market, it can actually trade higher or lower to its NAV, its underlying assets. Yes? ETF, I'm sorry, exchange traded fund. So you've heard like mutual funds? So a mutual fund, you'll put money into and they'll, and they'll, uh, they'll put the money in and at the end of the day, you'll know what the value is. It's like a basket of funds. And it's a basket of stock and it's actively traded. So one day they may own 1,000 shares of Apple, the next day they may own 500 shares. And ETF, they build a basket of stocks and they don't touch it. And then they take a portion of it and sell it on the exchange as an exchange traded fund. So it's, a, it's a, what's called passive investment. And what happens is, because it trades on the exchange, it can go, it can trade higher or lower to its underlying value. Whereas a uh, regular mutual fund, it, it's priced exactly what the underlying assets are. So if someone thinks, hey, I gotta get into Bitcoin, and this is the only way I can get into it, it may actually trade higher than the underlying value because the demand is higher for it. Is that, is that, does that make sense? I know it's, I, you, know, you know, I'm trying to explain it to you guys from Penn, so help me out here a little bit, all right? Uh, I, hear it's, I hear it's a really good school, right? That's what I heard. Uh, so, uh, so let me know if I'm getting off track here. But here you can see it's trading at a premium to the underlying value. 
And what has happened recently is it used to trade drastically at a premium. It is now pretty close to the underlying value, which shows that there is a lot more trading going on in it because the, all the activity is bringing down the swings. So there is actually a lot more activity in it uh, to what the NAV is. But that is the way that anybody, you don't have to have a Bitcoin wallet, you don't have to mine, you could go on and you could buy GPTC from an online broker, from a regular broker, from whatever, you can buy that, and you will have Bitcoin in your portfolio. Now, one thing I do want to point out, if anybody's been following the news, you remember the guys, the Winklevosses? Uh, that was Harvard, right? They were from Harvard. Right? Uh, you kicked their ass as well, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the Winklevosses were in the social, social network, the Facebook guys that got burned in, in Facebook. They actually went out and they actually own supposedly 1% of all the Bitcoin in the world, right? Ken, is that like yeah, yeah, something, something like that? Yeah, between the two of them. Yeah, right? Between the two of them. So they own about one, so they're trying to corner the market, but one. They bought Bitcoin really early. They bought them early. They bought them early. But what they also did is they, they started to put the paperwork through for their own ETF. So this is a famous thing, the Winklevoss ETF. The paperwork has been out there for a long time. March 11th, the SEC has to make a decision whether or not to approve it. If it gets approved, it will be approved by the SEC, which this is not. This one is not approved uh, by the SEC. That, that doesn't really mean much, uh, but it's kind of getting the blessing of the SEC. Once that happens on March 11th, they have to start buying Bitcoin to fund this. So the expectation is this is going to cause such a massive buy in Bitcoin that it's going to shoot up the price to create these ETFs. All right? The thing I'll tell you, my own prediction, it's not going to get approved. I don't think it will be approved. Because the Winklevosses also created their own exchange called the Gemini Exchange. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to do the ETF and use their own exchange to trade their own Bitcoin. And the SEC is not looking too kind on that. So that's why this has been sitting out there for a number of years. Um, I, I don't want to say who might be the first guys to do it before the Winklevosses, but um, there's probably going to be somebody else who's going to get out there. But the point is going to be that there will be an investment out there approved by the SEC for people to get into ETFs that you can buy uh, and sell on the exchange. Any questions on this? Yes. Uh, well, March 11th, the SEC has to make a decision. Yeah, I don't think, yeah. So if they don't rule on it, what's interesting is if the SEC doesn't do anything, then by default it gets approved. So the SEC basically has to, they, they can do nothing, approve it, or disapprove it. And what the, the thinking is that they may give them a further extension on it. So what they'll say is come back to us, here's a list of questions we need answered, come back to us in six months. Uh, because they, the SEC is trying to, this is a new, it's a new investment problem. So the SEC is trying to figure out what is this going to do, is it a real investment, um, how is this going to work, and they do have a concern because the legal boss is owned an exchange that's trading the Bitcoin on. So they do have a concern. It's a little bit of front running going on there. So. Potentially. Potentially. Yes, question. Yeah. So you said that GBTC had like this high premium. That is now gone from like 40 almost to 10 or something like that? Yeah, it's gone way down. Right, the premium's gone way down on it. So I see two reasons why that could happen. Sure. Number one, that a different ETF may be approved. Right. And so because of that, people don't want to pay the premium anymore. Right. You also said high liquidity would probably lead to that. Another thing that I can imagine is the GBTC, you, uh, when you invest in it as an accredited investor, you're not allowed to sell for like a year or so. For a year, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you were here, I got stuck holding for a year. Oh, okay. So it actually dropped down 50%, but I couldn't get out of it. Right. But that's not the case anymore. Now it, now it is. Right. right, so I I was thinking that that might probably be the, the reason why the premium is now lower, because all these guys in the beginning right. that have to actually go to sell it. Right. So that now the demand and supply demand is just 
that evening out, right? Like you couldn't yeah. sell, but yeah. now you would. Yeah, I think, I, I think, that's, I think that, that may be, but I also think there's been increased volume on it. And because of the increased volume, uh, the market has gotten, has gotten tighter. So it's not as thinly traded as it used to be. Uh, so just a quick thing. I want to go back to that chart that I had before about alternatives. And if I didn't put alternatives, but I put GBC, GBTC in my portfolio, you can see the return there. It's better than anything else, Dow Jones, NASDAQ, or anything. Uh, and these guys have seen it. So now you start to get the suits interested. The New York Stock Exchange guys, the guys from Fidelity, they're all like, oh, hey, we need to take a look at this Bitcoin stuff and start getting involved in Bitcoin. And all of a sudden, we're getting all these nice things that are being said about it. As I mentioned, I'm writing a book on this. And as we started to look at this, what we started to realize is that Bitcoin is not just an alternative investment. It's actually its own asset class, as a stock and bond is. It has a lot of characteristics of its own asset class. And we're going to explore this in the book uh, as well and, and go through this. And as I mentioned, Chris Berniski is, is uh, the co-author with me on this. And he's done a lot of work in this area. Uh, but here's one thing that I think is interesting, because this is always, as someone who's been involved with Bitcoin for a while, and you look at it and say, yeah, it's a neat investment, but that's not what it was made for. It was made to be used. It really was made to be used. And if, it's, and if you use it as an investment, you're basically taking it and you're putting it on the sidelines and you're not using it. And that's not what it was intended to, to, be, to be used for. Uh, so there is, there's always this discussion here. And if you see the percentage of, it, of Bitcoin being used strictly as an investment has gone up. And then there's a, there's a lower percentage of it as a transactional medium. But aside from the arguments around using, using Bitcoin, it as a transactional medium, as an investment, it starts to fit a lot of the analysis that you would be doing for, for uh, fundamental analysis of regular asset classes. And here's one that's interesting. I don't know if anyone's doing any uh, finance courses or anything else. Anyone familiar with the Sharpe ratio? OK, the Sharpe ratio is actually a uh, modern portfolio theory tool that you use, which basically says to you, if you're taking all this risk, Here's what you should be earning back for that risk. And you can actually put each of these different assets to that ratio. And what ends up happening, so for instance, if you took money and invested in oil, well, that's a risky investment. What should your returns be? That's what the Sharpe ratio is. And those are the low returns there. In Bitcoin, you're actually getting paid better than any other asset for the risk that you're taking. That's what a Sharpe ratio is. OK, is that? I know that I probably spent a whole, whole period of time on that. Uh, but that's one of the analytical tools that you use for financial evaluation. Now, let me show you a couple of things. Anybody here buy Bitcoin or own Bitcoin for themselves? Okay. When, when you buy Bitcoin, why do you usually buy it? Do you just go in and, and buy it? Do you just say, I need some Bitcoin? Is anyone doing anything more structured in terms of when they buy? Yes. So I do it for two reasons as an investor. And when I buy stuff, I'm like, okay. So I have two reasons why I would buy. Right. So you're using it as a transactional medium and also for investment. As also, as also for investment. But when you do buy it, do you say, I'm just going to buy it now, or do you do any analysis of whether it's the right time to buy it? Well, it's a combination. You have to have the cash to buy it. Yeah. So right. sometimes you just have cash. Right. Right. And sometimes you just don't. Right. How about others? I just buy weekly. Every week I buy some, regardless. If you use lawnmower. Yeah, lawnmower. Lawnmower is a great yeah, way of doing that. Lawnmower since the first purchase of Bitcoin, I think. Right, right, right. So you just kind of dollar cost average into it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of things related to technical analysis. And, and these are tools that you would use for any investment out there. Uh, now, I know, granted, this is pretty volatile, uh, Bitcoin. But if you start to look at the patterns, you can form the range that an asset is trading in. Does everyone see that range there? So what we look at is you have a support line that basically, over time, you can draw a line that says, every time it hits this, it bounces up. And then the top line is the resistance line. So in there is this range, this trading range that it's trading at, the support line and the resistance line. Do you see that? And what are we seeing here? We're seeing that at this point, it's kind of breaking out of the resistance line. That might be an indicator 
that you may want to buy this, uh, this because you see how it's gone outside of the range? Additionally, if this came back down and stayed below, that might be a sell signal. So let's take this out a little bit, a little bit further. And when you see that breakout here, and it actually then created a whole new range. Does everyone see that? A whole new range. It's actually a sideways range. But then as it, as it went and you started to create a new range, what ends up happening? What ends up happening is the old resistance line now becomes the new support line. And that means it's in a new trading range. That means that it is now essentially forming a trading range above that. Does everyone see that? I'm trying to make it as, as straightforward as possible. And you see how it tested it a couple of times? It bounced down and it bounced off. And it's the same line that goes from here. But instead of it being the, uh, the resistance line, it's now the support line for it. Ethereum is doing that right now. Right, and I'm going to show you Ethereum in a second. The Ethereum one is even easier to figure out. So here's something, here's something that is, is rather interesting. So you had that line going up. And if I took a range going back a little bit, and you can play around with this stuff. It gets wild. But there's a point where it crosses, which is right about here. That's a buy signal. That, to me, indicated, OK, it is now going into its next range. So if you notice, when it hit that line, it then stayed in this range, and it went higher. So if you are looking at Bitcoin and trying to find the, the buy signals, you can use the tools that people use with stocks and, and, other, and equities. Technical analysis. It's starting to work for Bitcoin because Bitcoin has become a mature asset. It is now, there's a lot of people trading it, and there is a lot of program trading going on. And when I say program trading, it's just like equity trading. There are programs out there running, and they're looking at certain price ranges. Okay, so it's not just the individuals trading anymore. You've got machines in there, everything else. So this is coming in more and more to play with telling you when's the time to buy and when's the time to sell. And then you can just get crazy with this whole thing and, and, and try and see when it's, it's breaking out and, and whatever. And see, here's a point going out, and it's kind of like, OK, I take the line out. So now it has a new support line, but then it broke the support line. Do you see that? New resistance line. Yep. Um, can you talk about the, uh, the volume of that uh, trading algorithm? For, for this stuff or for? Um, just in terms of like uh, what the actual dollar amounts are of some of these uh, programs that are doing this trading. Like, you know, you can sense like Yeah, you know, it's, um, um, I don't know what, I don't know what the numbers are, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing that I think is, is interesting uh, about that. Is there, I want to hear about uh, three or four weeks ago, the Chinese who were actually, the, the, they were buying, they were the major buyers of Bitcoin, buying this up like crazy. So you would go to sleep, and in the morning, Bitcoin would shoot up because you had all the Chinese people in there buying this. What happened is the Chinese government came in and they said, we're starting to shut this down. And when that happened, the thinking was that that was going to really impact the market. But what happened was, and I, I don't know the dollar, the, the dollar bombs. I'm not really good with numbers, I'm good with charts but not, not numbers, but it's, it's significantly gone up. In fact, the, the way to properly look at this is with a volume line at the bottom to start to see where some of this is. But the point was that the Chinese market actually dropped from the number one leading market to the number four market behind the US, Japan, and I think, uh, I forget who it was. But people were thinking this is gonna basically kill Bitcoin once the Chinese pull out of the market. And the Chinese are now, I think, about 4% of the market when they were like, over 50%, and Bitcoin went up in value. So there's, it's not just them who are doing the trade. You're getting, you're getting some sophisticated managers in the US and in, some, and in Japan as well who are also involved in this. Uh, so I, I didn't answer your, your thing. I don't even know the numbers. The, the interesting part is also that um, the Chinese price used to be higher than the US price, mm -hmm. the, and, and now it's the opposite. Now it's like, uh, uh, Coinbase is now driving the price, and everybody else is like in low Coinbase all of a sudden. Right. So it, it, Coinbase is not just uh, American, but it seems like that the US dollar slash American side is not driving the market right. versus before it was with Chinese. Right, right. It's, it's, it is a very interesting.
thing, and I know for, for you guys who aren't really familiar with Bitcoin, and you're like, well, what the hell is this thing? This is what's going on with it. I mean, it is trading actively. It is being used actively, uh, and, and it has become a global phenomenon. I mean, countries, uh, countries all over the world are using this, and regulatory agencies in these countries are starting to deal with it uh, as well and look at this. Now, one thing I do want to point out, I took this out as far as I could, and do you notice that there's a bit of a breakout going on right at the end point? That's pretty much where we are right now. Yes? When you talk about the price, uh, so what do you use as a criteria? It says Coindesk.com uh, right. account. So there's like a whole bunch of prices. What do you, what do you use? This is just a Coindesk CPI. This is the Coindesk price, pricing, which is an amalgamation of, of all of them. But, you know, I used to have a slide that used to show all of the different exchanges. And you go back about two years ago, and it was all over the place. I mean, you had these lines, and one was this going this way, one was going that way. Over the last year or so, they've all become very close to each other. And it's just, it's just the, the way things are going. So I just use the, the Coindesk um, uh, rate, which is an amalgamation. But like I said, they're getting closer. I mean, you could go on to Poloniex, and you could get a different price than you'd get on Kraken, than you'd get on, on uh, Coinbase. Yes, but it's a lot closer than it used to be. Brian? I just wanted to add, like, around the ETFs versus the exchanges right now. So if you want to invest, like, a significant sum of money in the Bitcoin, it's really, you're not going to want to put, like, 100 grand in the Bitcoin or Coinbase necessarily, because it's, you're just, there's too many risks involved. So in terms of U.S. investment, when we're talking about these ETFs, that's kind of like a legit like, mutual fund that's like government protected. And once that gets approved, you're going to see a lot of big money flowing through there. But in the meantime, you're seeing a kind of the market is spreading out from like China dominated trading towards uh, you know Japan, Russia, Korea, Pakistan, India. And there's, there's no government um, protection at all with ETFs. It's just that there's a bit of a blessing that this is a valid investment and it follows SEC regulations that are there. That's why it's taking so long. They're trying to still understand this on their own with these ETFs. So that's, you know, just because it's an ETF doesn't mean it's, it's safer than anything else, okay? I used to hear a lot, in fact, my son goes to, my son goes to college and he'll be working for a while, and he'll be like, Dad, I have $1,000, like $2,000. What should I do with it? And years ago, we would say, oh, go put it into this mutual fund, something around those times. And you guys, it's almost like, why not just put it into Bitcoin? Uh, if, you have these, if you have a chance to invest pretty cheaply into this uh, and into Bitcoin, and you have a long time to, to go with this, it's not a bad place to be uh, and a bad option to have. First, it's a mutual fund, which maybe goes up a little bit here or there, but I don't want this then. I want to come back to the Ethereum point that you mentioned earlier. Does anyone, does anyone have a thought where? Now, Ethereum, uh, I know some of you aren't familiar with Bitcoin, all of a sudden it's going something else. Ethereum is a, uh, let's call it a blockchain asset. It is something that trades. It is the second largest capitalized uh, blockchain asset that's out there. You can buy and sell Ethereum. Uh, it was created by uh, Bitlock. Uh, Taryn, who's pretty much a genius, uh, and there, there are a lot of applications that are being built on Ethereum. You can buy into that as well off of Coinbase. Does anyone see where the range for this kind of is? It's almost like I didn't even have to draw the lines for this. This seems to me to be trading right around the $10 to $15 range at this point. See, it dropped down a little bit, but it went right back up. And similarly, if you go back, you can see it's kind of staying in that range. That tells me that every time I see Ethereum go down to about $10, I'm going to buy it. I may be wrong, it may drop down, but just from looking at it on a technical basis, when I should go in and buy these types of things. So just using the simple tools that are out there for investment uh, research that you use for equities, you can use these on these assets as well. And as I mentioned, Ethereum is another blockchain asset. You guys, how many of you guys are familiar with Ethereum? Okay, so most of you. Anyone own Ethereum? Okay, great. Ethereum was up big today. Yeah, it's over 13. Yeah, it's up over 13. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I think Ethereum is, uh, is a hell of an investment. Uh, so here's the list of the top 10 cryptocurrencies. And there are actually 800 and growing cryptocurrencies that are out there. I will tell you that, what did I say, Ryan? About 80% of them? About 80% of them are garbage. Uh, not so much garbage, they have a use for them. But in terms of an investment vehicle, they're not where you want to put your money. In fact, as you get lower and lower on here, uh, I'm not sure you want to go with I know, I know it's somebody's seven big, o'clock. I know somebody's a big Dash fan here. Oh, I like that. Right. So each of these coins has their own purpose. If you take a look at Dash and Monero and Zcash, those are coins that provide privacy to your transactions. So these coins all have different purposes out there. So they're all they're all different. Ripple is something that's used uh, for financial transactions. So all these coins have different purposes out there. Ethereum Classic was created when there was a fork of the Ethereum uh, asset and people didn't like the new Ethereum so they created the Ethereum Classic. Just so you know, the guys who created the uh, GBTC are now creating an Ethereum Classic uh, trust. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah, because it's the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so they're doing that. Does anyone want to take a guess at what was the best performing of these cryptos last year? Monero. Monero is. Uh, what does it mean performing? So. In terms of from, you know, yeah, percentage gain from the end of the year to the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So it was Monero, which um, it, I don't think it really shows here. That's just a seven day. But Monero has gotten a lot of publicity as a, as a privacy uh, cryptocurrency, a blockchain asset. When you talk about best performing, are you saying risk adjusted? Or Nah, I'm just saying, use pure money, pure, pure performance, pure performance out there. Uh, I mean, it probably there's more risk involved with Monero than, than there would be with Bitcoin. But no, just from a purpose of just over, the, over time. That doesn't mean that I would invest in it, quite honestly, but just in terms of how it's gone up. It also shows the, uh, the increase in privacy-related cryptocurrencies. Uh, so this is, a, this is just a, a list of the top 10 that are here. Uh, the, one of the next things you're going to see are portfolios of these different blockchain assets. So, for instance, like I said, you had these privacy cryptos like Monero, uh, Dash, Zcash. You could potentially see an ETF created or an investment portfolio created of just those cryptos that are related to that specific type of blockchain asset. So this is going to be a growing area, this creation of portfolios out there. And in fact, the company I'm just going to talk about uh, in a minute, Lawnmower, basically came up with a blockchain index where they took the top blockchain assets in it as a way to show how is the whole blockchain market going. And rather than taking everything together, they just took the highest quality ones and they've created this blockchain index to show you how this is moving. Now, that could be created in its own portfolio and its own ETF or, uh, or however you want. Let me just move on to, to this. Ken mentioned before that he's out there buying Bitcoin using lawnmower, and he does this on a dollar cost averaging basis, where he's basically putting in 20, 30, 40 dollars a week into Bitcoin. He's not looking for the, for the dips and the analysis. He's just basically putting the money away. And that's called, called dollar cost averaging. Over time, you should basically get it in at a price that um, that is lower than what it's worth over time. So this is just a little chart on that. As uh, Ken mentioned, uh, Lawnmower, which is a company I was involved in from the, from the start. I was an angel investor to the company. And I will tell you that there are opportunities out there, not only for accredited investors, those are investors who have to have a certain amount of money, but for just about any investor to get involved with startups. Uh, and there's these things called ICOs, initial coin offerings. Has anyone been involved with an ICO? Okay. Where you can get in and you can buy a coin. Uh, Factum was, uh, I don't know if Factum was involved. I'm actually an angel investor with Factum as well. Uh, but some of, these, some of these cryptos come along and they sell their coin almost as shares of the stock, and that's how they raise money. So you can find these if you have a little bit of money. You don't have to invest a lot. There's a site called Bank 
to the future, BNK to the future, where you can get in and you can become an angel investor uh, or an early stage investor for about $1,000. Actually, $1,000 worth of Bitcoin. And well, you can, but you have to be accredited. You do you have, have to be accredited. You do have to be accredited. In the US, yeah. you, have, in the US you have to be accredited. Yeah. So there, there are some, there, that may change with the Jobs Act, with the crowdfunding. So that may change. And you're going to see some more portals coming up where people can buy in. Uh, but it's worth taking a look at because you're going to see the companies that are going to be starting up uh, from there. But uh, Lawnmower basically created an app that uh, allowed, allowed you to buy, put money down, uh, and buy dollar cost averaging. Easy to use, right, Ken? Easy yeah, to use? Yeah. Right, they did a really good job of putting a lot of research in there and a lot of tools, uh, financial analysis tools in there. And they actually tracked about 25 cryptocurrencies and made it very easy to use. They did such a good job of it that uh, they never even got to their uh, uh, A round and they were bought out recently by Coindesk, which Coindesk is probably the largest media company um, related in the Bitcoin industry. Can you quickly explain? Bears to say that I don't know how long more works. Paul, can you can you quickly sure. explain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me. I'll spend it. Spend a little bit of time. Actually, be an app that I've been looking for. Yeah, you can actually go online. You can download. It. You yeah. can just go to Lawnmower and download. And basically, you can pick and choose and follow. Uh, you can follow. I think up to twenty-five cryptocurrencies. It'll give you the bid. It'll give you the price right then and there. It'll actually give you analysis. Uh, of each of those different assets. And then you can actually go in, you do have to set up an account with Coinbase. Mm -hmm. So you set up an account with Coinbase, which means that you can buy Bitcoin or Ethereum, and you can say to it, buy Bitcoin and Ethereum $20 a month, or $20 a week, and do it on a recurring basis. Coinbase actually just integrated that same functionality onto their site. So their ability to do it on a recurring basis was not a competitive advantage. For them so anymore. can I do this? So I'm aware of what I'm doing that on one this In fact, right. I buy a new week. Right. And you do the recurring basis? On any theater. Right. Right. And I put like a percentage of my cash flow right. away that way. Right. Um, but I would like to have more like 20. 20 mm -hmm. Right. Up. So right. what I now do is I then use that to buy my own stuff. Right. Same here. So you can't have like, no. They they weren't able to. They they were at the point of trying to make the jump right. to Poloniex, to Kraken, or whatever to buy these other. So assets. what I've been looking at, what people that talk to me about Bitcoin have been looking for, is something like an ETF that buys like twenty or fifty coins, right. and that does not exist. Anymore. No, does it doesn't. Exist? No, it doesn't. That's why I said that's one of the next things to come along. Yeah. Is something where you can buy in, and in fact that was on. The table that was on future developments for lawnmower, but like I said, we're just going to pull it out. Okay. So, have you heard of Economy or yeah. Lawnmower? Is that is lawnmower feeling, feeling pressure from those two? They're not feeling pressure anymore. They just got pulled out. Okay. <laughs> so maybe the guys who pulled them out are feeling pressure, but they're feeling pretty good. Some of the investors. Are pretty good. But is is that something what they do? Is that, yeah. I mean, right. That's a platform. Right. It has a coin associated with it. Oh, right. Or doesn't. No. I don't, I don't know too much, but. no. But it's not live yet. No. Yeah. yeah. The no. coin, so, so, so that's, a, if I understand, the blockchain and the platform, they're going to have a fund that they manage themselves mm -hmm. and also provide a platform to make a fund on, on your own. If, yeah. If, if I understand. Yeah. It's, I mean, that. that's right around the corner. But that, and that, believe me, that was in the plans going forward for this. But, you know, it got. It got grabbed, but that's going to happen. So it's going to become very easy for people to buy a basket or individual cryptos, other cryptos that are out there. Uh, and and that's so you're going to have to start to be thinking which one is a good crypto. Like you know, there's 800 of them out there. Most of them are garbage. Uh, my apologies to those who have them, uh, who created them. But from an investment standpoint, they're garbage. Yes. Any idea when some of those might be coming down the line? Well, I don't know. When, what's what's the story with the uh, economy? I mean, uh, I don't know. Like probably Q3 of this year, and then Mellonport uh, is going to be a little bit after that in the summer. Right. Uh, the, the next ICO I will invest in, uh, 
that launches in two days, it's peer place. What is it? Peer place. I, I think I have to buy Peer place? It. Peer place, yeah. No, what do they do? That's a gaming blockchain based on graphene. Um, and it will allow uh, gambling and gaming, also esports, uh, prediction market. So it's basically a blockchain for that. Are they associated with game credits? No. Do you know game credits? Yeah. Um, do you not like game credits? I, I don't have them. Okay. Okay. I can't. I can't. I can't have everything. Why not? Come on, you're making all this money in Bitcoin. Come on, yeah, funnel some of it off. Did you buy some game yeah, credits? Yeah. All right. Uh, well, that game credits is a nice mixture, and as well, that will be of the gaming industry with cryptos. That's, that's going to be yeah. next. That's going to be a big. Uh, Jack, can you explain a little bit about what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Do you like game credits? I, I know the company very well. Okay. I don't know. Right, Ryan. We that's we met with the, the guys. I, I know the guys very very well. It's actually very interesting because they came up with this coin called game credits about four years ago, and it did nothing. So these guys in, in uh, let's say Eastern Europe, uh, I don't want to get specific with the countries, but in Eastern Europe, uh, this large mobile gaming company decided that they're going to integrate cryptos into their game platform. And they're one of the largest mobile game platforms. Anybody play uh, Fangora? Anybody ever hear Fangora? Or get the gun? They're very big in Russia. That's all, I, that's all I know. So what they did is, rather than go and create their own coin, they went and they grabbed this dormant coin called Game and brought it in and integrated it into their system. So they had this coin out there that was basically not doing anything. Somebody created it, the code was out there, it wasn't going anywhere. Instead of creating their own, they grabbed that and integrated it into their games. So they now have, within the game, you can be playing a mobile game and you can earn a game credit. And you can use the game credit to buy uh, weapons, to buy uniforms, whatever you whatever you do in these in these games. Uh, you know, I'm an old guy. I don't know how to play. I, you know, I'm lucky with Palm. So uh, you can you can do things in game with these game credits. Plus, they've created a mobile store. Like, um, what's that store that all you guys use uh, when you buy a game? Steam. Steam. I know it because I see it on my credit card. <laughs> my son, all right? So Steam, yeah, that's it. That's an name. So, so they're going to create one of those where you can buy and sell games with the game credits, and the developers will be able to benefit from it. So it, it's kind of an interesting thing. You can take a look at the game credits. They're actually doing an ICO as well, for, uh, for specifically for the mobile gaming uh, store. Uh, but I know the guys there. The guys are really good guys, right? Ryan can... Verify. We were at a conference last year in Vegas, and I think they won the they won some some award. Yeah, they won some award or something okay. along those lines. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, anyway, a little bit more about uh, uh, about lawnmower, and this is actually to to your point that was brought up. This is actually where they were going to be going next, and they were going to build portfolios like a payment portfolio, so you could put fifty. $40, $50, $40 into this, and it would allocate automatically between Bitcoin, Ripple, Dash, and Litecoin, which are payment, which are payment coins, payment categorization. Same thing with smart contracts. You'd go between Ether, BitShares, Counterparty, and the same thing with dApps. So they were going to build this so that you could use the same sort of ability to invest $40, $50. Now you're putting it into a portfolio. So that would have been neat. But I, I, think, I think that whole... Market is still about two to three years away. I don't know if that if the other guys can come up with that. I believe it's about two or three years away, which was one of the considerations of, of why they did what they did. Because it's still, you know, it's, it's a great idea, but it's still it's still a ways away uh, being able to do that. Uh, but I, I think a lot of people would do that because a right. lot of people. Yeah. It's a lot of work to invest in crypto right now because there's a new ICO coming up every week. So like I think there's a lot of people that have money that would love to invest two or two like that. Right, but you know the challenge. The challenge is the the, the most reputable exchange out there is CoinDesk, uh, yeah, Coinbase. Yeah. It really is. Uh, you know, it is. They have you know, uh, and then you start to go to the Krakens, the Poloniex, 
to the yo bids or whatever. I mean, I've, I, I chased after this cryptocurrency called Aurora Coin. Has anyone ever heard yeah, of Aurora yeah, Coin? You know Aurora Coin? Aurora Coin was actually uh, distributed in Iceland to every single person in Iceland got Aurora Coin. And they didn't know what to do with it. You know, they, they had no idea what to do with it, and it, it kind of died. It's made it's a, coming back. It's coming back, and one of the reasons it's coming back is because they have a party in the government called the Pirate Party. You guys know the Pirate Party? Yes. Pirate Party is very cool. She's great, Brigitte. I've met Brigitte, who runs the, uh, the Pirate Party in Iceland. I've been to Iceland. Iceland's amazing. If you have a chance, go to Iceland. Uh, but Brigitte uh, is from the pri Pirate Party. If they get into power, and there was a chance for them to get into power last year, if they get into power, there's the potential for Aurora Coin to be coming back. So I couldn't find it anywhere. So I had to go out to this exchange. I think it was Yobit or something. Um, see, he heard about Aurora Coin. He wants it. He wants some action too. Uh, so, uh, so, but I had to go to a real shady exchange, and that's what you have to do for some of these other coins. So, so that's uh, the, the, the Florida exchange that's broke now. That's where I have my Aurora Coin. So that's why I don't have. It. Yeah, and that's the problem. Um, I think Ryan said it. Ryan said it er earlier, um, where if. Bitcoin and blockchains don't get hacked. What gets hacked are the exchanges, where your coins are. So you don't want to deal with a shitty exchange. You really don't. But unfortunately, if you want to go out and get some, some crazy ass crypto, you may have to go there. Because right now, all you can get on Coinbase is Ether and Bitcoin. So that's why I'm saying it's still two to three years away, because they have to have arrangements with those different exchanges to do that. So it does sound great. It's great in, it's great in theory. It'll happen. It's just going to take time for it to happen. You're going to still see a shakeout of all the exchanges that are there. Yes, sir. Uh, Eric, in our earlier slide, you talked about the usage of the coin increasing for investment purposes and actually decreasing for actual usage trading. Could you address that and um, talk about how that relates to um, continuing that what value it provides since? If it continues that way, if people aren't using it other than paid users or it's speculative trading, right? Where does it where does it go from there? What's it's, that's a big discussion point. That is a big discussion point. Now you've got to remember with Bitcoin, Bitcoin is still being released. You can still mine for Bitcoin. Yes. So there's still an amount of Bitcoin that's still yes. coming out. Uh, yes. It, is a lot of it going to being used for investment purposes? Absolutely. Will there be more of it being used for investment purposes? Absolutely. If you get these ETFs, you're going to have more people using it for investment purposes. Once you put it into an investment, it's on the sidelines. Right. It's not being used. Uh, so that can be good or bad. That could raise the value of it because if it is of value as a transactional medium, which I think you're still going to see apps that will come along because of remittances, because of other financial currency types of things, and uh, applications for the unbanked where Bitcoin will still have a value. So, so actually, what ends up happening is if you have that Bitcoin that's on the sidelines being used as an investment, you can't use it as a medium of exchange. But if there's more applications for it as a medium of exchange, that's going to raise the value of it. Does it, that make sense? It does. What confidence do we have that there will really be significant more applications that will be using it you know, I mean, you can. There are there are companies right now that are working and making money with Bitcoin as a remittance solution. Right. In countries like Mexico, right. uh, in in Kenya, I'm actually working with a company in Kenya that is actually uh, the price difference between a remittance through Bitcoin, which is maybe 0.05 percent of the value of of the amount versus Western Union, which takes a, a 10 to 20 percent haircut. I get that. You know, so so there's a real need there. Plus, there's no, it's the unbanked. So there's going to be more of this going on because the economics are there. Uh, is Bitcoin the point to do it? Right now, it has the most. It's, it's the most established to do it. So you're going. I think you will start to see more of that happen, and the numbers increase with just that act. Remittances. And, and helping the unbanked. 
And there's other things that I think will happen. What's so well, there, I would hope there's supporting data behind it. Because <coughs> I hate to say it, hope is not a strategy. Right? So um, it, is where, it is where it becomes a speculation. In, in all honesty, it is, a, it is a speculative asset because you've got to say, I'm buying this coin, which exhibits investment characteristics. Yes. Without a doubt, it, it, it exhibits investment characteristics. You can put the investment tools through it. But then you've got to say, what's really behind it providing the value? And uh, I do believe that there's enough applications for it and for these other blockchain assets to give it a utility. But is it going to disrupt the entire financial system? I don't know. But, but speculation is also an application. So this is what people often forget. Um, in the life cycle of Bitcoin, the first thing that is bringing value into the system. So when you launch a currency, you have to figure out how does value travel inside of this ecosystem. Right? And right now, this value comes in through speculation. Right? So like for instance, I'm both a speculator, but I also use it. I do all my Amazon shopping with Bitcoin. Um, but most of, like, if you look at my value, right, like my investment is vastly bigger part of, you know, the, the, the value that I bring into the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. And probably a lot more value comes into the ecosystem. So this is also value, um, but this might change kind of what application will drive the value into the system, might change over the life cycle. But I think Satoshi, figured out, like, how do I bring value in the system and build something that in the beginning speculators can be the first guy to, and now I'm just speculating, right, move money into the system, right? So this volatility that everybody is crying about is actually also a mechanism to track value because the speculators now all buy Bitcoin because in order to trade, they have to buy it. So this is actually part of what might be like a longer term when, when the currency is bigger, then there will be less volatility, and then the speculators will leave, and the other, the other applications will use it more. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a hope that, that with all the speculation, as he's saying, it gets people interested in looking at it, but then there has to be legitimate use cases for it. Uh, and and one, thing, one thing that he said is if you want to buy some of these other cryptocurrencies, if you want to use any exchange besides Coinbase, and Coinbase adheres to the uh, US regulations, so you can take dollar bills and put it into Coinbase. You cannot do that with some of these other exchanges. So if you want to buy Dash on another exchange, you have to have Bitcoin first. So, so now you're using Bitcoin as a utility for investing. So there's, there's another thing there as well. But I do agree with you, I think there has to be some, some some more hardcore use cases out there, applications for Bitcoin as a utility vehicle. I think, I think they're there. International settlements will be the number one uh, driven force because uh, all of this other economy, not only depending on the US dollar to transactions, it settles all other countries, China, Brazil, Mexico. Yeah, the settlements and the remittances are going to be huge. Ken, did you have a, you have a point? Uh, I'm going I know. just wanted to let us, uh, they're cutting us an hour short. Okay, so all right. We got, we're getting kicked out at eight instead of nine. Oh, all right. So sorry, I've gone, I've gone on way too much. Let me bring up, can I just bring up Get Gems? Yes, I would yeah, like you guys. Okay. Okay. Like sure. All right, all right. Sorry about that. Um, you know, as you see, I can, we can go on to this stuff for a while. You have an error message. Oh. Um, you know how to get that yeah. out of there? All right, so here's, here's something I wanted to throw out here to the group. And Ken has been playing with this. Uh, GetGems was an application I was involved in, I invested in. And basically, it's, it's, a, it's like an orphan application at this point. And what I mean by that is a, an orphan application, meaning that the developers have moved on to something else. So this is sitting out there. And the potential exists for, for people to get involved in this and potentially find some value and jump on and build some applications and work directly with the developers of this. Uh, this application has been written up, uh, the book Blockchain Revolution, anyone see that, that book? It's been written up in that, in that book. It's, um, it's got a lot of money behind it. The, uh, the guys who originally started it went and are doing something else. 
and now this um, basically there's an opportunity here for, for anybody who wants to find value for it. Basically, what it is, it's a Telegram-based messaging app. Are you guys familiar with Telegram? Does anyone use Telegram? It's like a WhatsApp, internationally based. You can build applications within Telegram. They built this application within Telegram. It works on a mobile and a web basis. It actually has an integrated Bitcoin wallet. Everybody who signs up for it gets a Bitcoin wallet. So I can send right now to Ryan, who's a Get Gems person, I can send him money from within the application to Ryan as well. They also came up with their own nat native uh, coin called Gems, which uh, you can actually send back and forth among people that, as well. You get an airdrop of Gems every day. You get uh, Gems if you watch advertising. So this was originally built to handle what's called the attention economy. Basically pay you for your attention. So the more you use it, the more gems you get every day. It gets dropped, right? Do you get an airdrop? Yeah, airdrop every day. Uh, you get an airdrop uh, every day. And it's encrypted and you can create your own group here as well. We have access to the developers of this to go and develop applications within it. This is a worldwide a uh, global application. There are a lot of people who use this. I just think the opportunities are huge with this. And basically, uh, it's been kind of, there, there's people in other countries who are doing things with it. We have an opportunity for Philly uh, meetup guys or the Penn guys, whatever, want to get involved with this. Please uh, let Ken or I know, actually let Ken know. Yeah. And we'll get you on here. And anyone who signs up will give you 100 gems just so you get them as well. And the gems originally were something that they were uh, allowing you to transfer into like debit uh, uh, cards, like a Starbucks card or something like that. Uh, we're killing that because I want I want the currency to float and have people from the community decide what they want to do with it. So we're looking at it as more as like a reward points, like membership points, like you get with Amex. So if someone comes along, like for instance, my book is on here. So if you if you sign up, you'd be able to download my book. You can put files here, so you can. You can download the book, and I can also say, if you want the book, it's 100 gems. So we're creating a marketplace as well on this where people can sell uh, goods or services for gems or for Bitcoin as well. So I think there's a lot that can be done with this, uh, but if you want if you want to get into it, um, the, uh, the web application is web.getgems.org. You can sign up. You can find me, Jack Tater. If you do sign up, I'll send you gems. I would just love to have some people try it out and potentially have people come up with uh, applications here. Potentially, we can get a group of people to come together. I will connect you up with the developers there, and basically, maybe there's something that you guys can do uh, for profit or for uh, development purposes there within this app. This app is worldwide. There's, you know, there's a few hundred thousand users uh, on this right now, and, and that's probably going to continue to grow. So. So I know you have, I know it's coming short, but thank you so much. Like I said, if you want to get in, involved in this, I think it's an opportunity. Let Ken know, uh, and we're going to keep things going on, on this group. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, guys. So we're going to have uh, Luciano speak next. I just first off wanted to mention, uh, initially we had had this plan to be from 6 to 9 p.m., it's going to be from 6 to 8, and this is a great learning experience for us, uh, just because as a heads up, we're going to have two other uh, events upcoming here at the university. So Ethereum was mentioned, and there's an Ethereum dev shop in New York called Consensus. We have one of their uh, lead folks who's going to be speaking here on March 16th, and then we also have Tone Vise, who is a well-known um, Skeptic. Skeptic and trader in the Bitcoin arena. So get involved in the uh, upcoming events. Please join the Bitcoin Philadelphia Facebook group. So when we run initiatives like Get Gems, uh, you know, you guys can get involved. And just as a side note, um, I've worked in Bitcoin full time for almost two years. And I can tell you guys, if you're in college, if you want to get involved in this space, like people like me and Jack, uh, can just put you in touch with like actual investors and people that will want to help out and get involved. Bitcoin, if you can get involved in the Bitcoin and blockchain arena as a college student, you're just differentiating yourself 
right away in something that is continuing to grow and will just get you like uh, unprecedented opportunity. But I did want to let Luciano speak uh, for the last half hour here. Again, for the upcoming events, we'll be a little bit more structured. We'll make sure we have more time for just talking and Q&A. Again, this was a really good learning experience, but uh, Luciano is really involved with the community in here. It's national, but here in Philadelphia too, it's called Swarm City. And they're essentially creating a decentralized version of Uber and Lyft, so you don't have to rely on their services, which charge fees and just so many restrictions. So, Luciano, man. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, guys. I'll make this short uh, and sweet as possible. Sorry. So, <laughs> so actually, um, we all love our gig economy, right? Uh, Uber. Airbnb, mm -hmm. and um, what happens when they're not there anymore? What would happen to you guys here in campus if uh, there was no more ride sharing? Or what would happen to the whole city of Philadelphia? Like it happened in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and it caused chaos. Uh, what would it, like it may happen in the whole country of Argentina? So we are now so dependent in this. Uh, great uh, abilities of the giga economy. And um, I'll tell you what I think uh, Philadelphia would do if, if there was no more ride sharing, complete shut off, complete cut off. I think you guys will regroup and regroup on Facebook, most likely like Austin, Texas did. And right now there's a group of over 40,000 people that has been using this system to, to, to do their own ride sharing. And not only ride sharing, it's, it's open it up to, to the whole giga economy. And it's mind boggling to me that uh, a company like, like Uber, which is the number one unicorn, and it did it faster than everyone out there. Did it faster than Microsoft. It did it faster than Facebook, and even faster than Google, yes. In five years, $50 million valuation. And yet, these drivers that are struggling to make minimum wage in some markets, even like in New York. So what Uber sold was the idea of peer-to-peer -peer economy. But a centralized bank-owned corporation cannot deliver peer-to-peer. -peer. Jack can tell you that the people that can really do peer-to-peer -peer and actually deliver are the blockchain kids, the kids on the blockchains, right? So now we have uh, this technology available for, for us. And the, the great thing is not, it's not a company. It's just a, a distributed system that is out there for everyone in the world to use it today. And uh, this is what the Swarm is. The Swarm is a decentralized, um, decentralized system to, to, uh, to apply it to anything you want to into the giga economy. So you can actually rent your home, host your home or do ride sharing for, um, for basically what it will be um, right now, sweet tokens is what's running on the, on the protocol. But the sweet tokens are not, uh, you're not obliged to, to trade in, into this. So you can actually, uh, the consensus of, of a transaction would happen between just two individuals. The, the great thing with, with blockchain is that the consensus happens in the community itself um, and with, without, without any centralized uh, entity to dictate rules, uh, the, the consensus happens uh, beautiful between just the participants and regulated between the participant. And I can tell you that uh, what, is, what has been happening in, right now in over 600 cities in the whole world, there's been um, 
apply to. And what is exciting to me is that now uh, a kid or a father in a country like Venezuela or India doesn't have to transact in a in hyperinflated paper note that is based on a debt. They can uh, do one of the services, ride sharing or hosting, and right away start earning and start earning a, a currency, which is basically the most advanced currency system that we have today. And, and someone in this economy can have immediate part, counterpart with like a, a banker with, from London. And um, this is all due to the open nature of blockchain uh, and the open access and is nearly free. So essentially uh, anyone with a cell phone can um, open up and start uh, use, uh, using some of the Facebook pages today. This is not a blockchain project for 2020. Uh, is actually a project that is available today for even a mother in North Philly can use this today. Someone in, uh, in Russia can use this today um, and start applying some of the uh, Ethereum protocol that we learned earlier. That's, it was an incredible, an incredible project that was released um, basically at the end of 2015 and it's been backed by even major uh, Fortune 500 corporations and has the attention of all the banking industry, banking, the biggest banking names in the, in the industry. Well, if this blockchain is good enough for, for them, I think is, is good enough for us to at least not, not only have an academic approach into it, somewhat of a yogic approach into, into it of inclusiveness, where you can participate in, in all these blockchain projects like Bitcoin, Ethereum, the Swarm City, they all belong to the participant. So the incentive of the network to do well is within everybody. And, um, I think this is one of the applications that is actually going to drive uh, mainstream adoption because of the easiest, the easy of usage, and also because it can provide someone right away with a substantial amount of production to at least put a roof and food in. in in their table for their family. So um, don't take it from me, guys. Uh, check it out everywhere on social media. RK City was the old name. Now is the, the, new, the new name is Swarm City. Uh, this technology is uh, available from the grace of Satoshi, Vitalik, and, and Chris. Yes, even Chris. Um, and it's available today for everybody to go and try it. Uh, we also uh, have the Slack channel, um, Swarm City, and um, Swarm City is the is the is the actual page. And um, from there, you can easily um, either uh, create a new user or start swapping uh, value between. Uh, between uh, some of your counterparts. So this is what I have for you guys. If you guys have any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm with you. So first of all, uh, so you're here in Philly. Where are you, are you a developer? Where are the no, developers so, for this uh, project? So mo most of the developers, um, like any blockchain project, all of the development is, is code. Everything is code. So everything is uh, online, but a lot of the uh, developers are in Antwerp in uh, Belgium, uh, but uh, there are some developers even from Argentina connecting. So wherever there's a good uh, development team, but the development team is pretty solid because Vitalik Buterin, which started um, Ethereum, 
Well, his father's involved in, into this project somewhat as an advisor. And um, from, from his words, he basically checked with his son, like, are these developers for real? So apparently they got a blessing from the child genius that the development. And actually, you know what, guys? I used it. And I, I already used some of the properties, like uh, the whisper messaging thing. And this is great because this is the most, the fastest, most secure, the most peer-to-peer -peer transactions I ever did was with this new aspect of the Ethereum protocol, which is the, the whisper, uh, the whisper uh, messaging part is so fast, so quick, you know, waiting for a Bitcoin transaction for 10, 10 30 minutes sometimes, right? This is in second and you, it's very secure, very cool. Um, you guys used to be kids. Yes. Yes. What happened with that? A fork. Okay, so they calling it a social fork. So there was <laughs> there was no actual technological fork. You see, the 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 the, the founder of the idea of RK City and the word city it is because the whole project is to take all the, all of the services and amenities of a city and putting it in the cloud, right? So you need ride servicing, uh, ride sharing is, it, is in there. Uh, if you need uh, uh, any type of, uh, what? Yeah, any, any type of services that you would want to. Well, he, he dreamed this, he, he was not a developer, he pushed this, like anyone in experience in this new, space um, did some mistake he registered the name and, and this is one of one of the main reasons why the name changed because the name was registered in such manner that it was never going to be able to be really out there and be completely decentralized all of this all of this decentralized system initially they built they be built by uh, initial uh, by initial developers and then they release it, right? Just like Bitcoin. At the beginning it was just Satoshi Nakamura and whoever else. And um, this is how all this development happens, right? Well, he did it wrong. So they had to change the name. Plus, the community didn't want him at the front because of his past. I'm not one of them. I don't care about anybody's past. I, the, the great thing about the blockchain is it's a system built on truth and it's verifiable. So as long as it's in an open blockchain, open innovation, open to anybody come and be a developer, you don't need permission, permissionless. That's good with me. And if it's good, if, if it's good enough for if the Ethereum protocol is good enough for, for all of the attention that it has attracted, it's good enough for me. So, so you mentioned it's Swarm. Is it at all associated with uh, the book Swarmwise? Some of the concept, uh, yes. Because he's the guy that created the pirate party. Yes, and some of the concept on how we operate are strictly from the book. That's interesting. Yes. We so, free online, by the way. yes, it's all free. This is all free. This is why a kid in Venezuela can pick up his phone today and start producing in the most innovative currency system in the world right now because of this. Because it's a it's a free um, network based on human collaboration. I think it's bringing the best of humanity, and I uh, I suggest the academia here and everywhere. Please just don't look at this from the outside. The best way is to come and check it out. Yeah, check it out. Try to use Swarm City. Swarm City. If, uh, so is it built on top of Ethereum? Yes. Know. Yes. It's built on top of Ethereum and is following along with the ETH, the Ethereum Classic. Uh, I'm not sure <coughs> if it's ever going to be able to be run in there, but um, for, for now it's just on, on, uh, on Ethereum. And I can tell you that 
the development for the actual mobile app is coming in quick. I've been involved um, in some of the testing uh, I mentioned and, and what is actually available live and is, is pretty awesome on how quick. You know, Ethereum is a, is a new protocol for smart contracts and it's really, straight, it's really new, right? But apparently, it, it is easier to code than Bitcoin, for example. So the development gets done a lot faster. That's what I've been experiencing. Yeah, Bitcoin's code wasn't written to be manipulated that many times to do that many different things. So that's why Vitalik's all need for Ethereum. I can tell you guys that Vitalik is truly, uh, uh, Vitalik Buterin is truly a, a genius, like almost from another, I wouldn't say from another yes. world, but, but uh, the, the amount of, um, Yes, the amount of the, the amount of implementation that has been coming. This is why, yes, Monero did best in 2016, but it should have actually been Ethereum. We all agree, right? Yeah. If it wasn't because of the DAO that's hack, yeah, that's because split. of the DAO hack, it would have it would have been it would have done about uh, well at some point it did 21x in one in six months. So, uh, 17. 17. at some point it did 21. 70. 70? Oh, well. I had seven years. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Only time in my life. I have well, two questions. Can I invest? And B, do you have a business strategy? So one of the problems you have with competing against Uber is that they have a good marketing strategy. And in order to compete with them, and that is very hard to do in a decentralized way. So like, if you, for instance, want to launch in Philly, where we have lived in Uber, how would you actually do that? Does, and, and a lot of what I see with crypto projects why I don't invest is because that is what often is lacking and I feel like it's like in 2000 when we had these anything with an internet address got evaluated but in the end you still need a business strategy. So this is what also when I read about your project I've, I've never seen. So do you have an, an idea about that or does like a business kind of slash marketing exist or Yes, so this community is is pretty broad, right? So uh, Bernard Lamb now, from which is uh, somewhat considered as the lead of the project, or at least the lead vision, is uh, putting in a lot of work to do some um, marketing uh, uh, at the corporate state where they are offering mobility solutions for even uh, 500 companies, uh, four to 500 companies out in Europe, and um, in my opinion, the, the, the way I see it is that there are places right now where this is needed. You don't need marketing. You just, yeah, the people that believe in it will speak it loud. Well, enough. no, the people that really need it will start using it. You know how they're using Bitcoin in Venezuela, guys, uh, by the way, the only reason why I keep mentioning Venezuela, I lived there, I grew up there, my brother's from there. They're using Bitcoin to bring in food back into the country. So they, uh, they hustle Bitcoin work however they can, even by doing some tasks on computer, like mindless tasks on computer, and sometimes earning more than an official from the government. And... Um, getting an Amazon account and sending it back and smuggling back into the country because right now they have a... So this is what blockchain offers. Solutions, and now in the United States, competing with Uber and, um, and Lyft, it's going to happen. And once it starts to happen, it will take off really fast because the... Uh, the capabilities that you can offer on Uber will always be lagging way behind, light, light years behind. It's just when you are able to transact with another human being, truly peer-to-peer -peer is, is endless. You can offer different services. The only thing that will keep you honest there is hopefully the blockchain in the community. So this is why I think uh, um, it will be very successful uh, fairly quick 
starting not uh, so the, the the places where it has done really quick already is when there's no other option right so like in Austin Texas there was an explosion a bunch of uh, people just that would be our peers here right very similar to us tomorrow no more ride sharing that's what happened no not like it happened here maybe maybe it's going to happen in Philadelphia they threatened with an uber cape cape no I'm, I'm talking about a complete shut off if you think about the amount of people going in and out of out of the airport and out of the main hubs of every city in America and the amount of vehicles that Uber takes out of circulation is, is unsustainable. There's nothing that the country or, or uh, the government can do to sustain the, the, the mobility anymore. We need ride sharing. And if we truly believe in peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing, is Swarm City is gonna have the lead because it, it has the, the most experience and 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 the most in it the most skin in it uh the ICO there's, there's also very many western countries where ride sharing is not possible france i'm german okay um i was looking for uber to work anywhere mm -hmm. um, taxis are very expensive there's tons of people that are unemployed in many of the european countries yes so but again i believe there needs to be an economic model that that works the, the one thing that this is not, guys, this is not a government uh, a pro program. So just because there's no um, ride sharing permission in Europe, it, it's not going to stop this. People are going to do this because they can. Yeah, say, like you said, there's a high unemployment, right? So if I'm unemployed, I have a car, I have to pay my car insurance, I'm going to use my car to help people get around. Yeah, of well, you as a tourist hop on that local area's Facebook and use hashtag need a ride, a local person will see that in that geotagged area and be like, hey, let's negotiate. So you're taking that, that Facebook group, which is what they're using right now, and helping you, the local, communicate with me, the tourist, so we can negotiate a tour. So you can use your car to help me get around. Yes, and the, and there will be earning, let's say, they, the, the cool thing is they can request, you can request to get paid um, when, when you transact with, with anyone, you can request to get paid in U.S. dollar, in euros, and with credit card it's if you have the ability, you Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Ether, um, discounts, you can get creative. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe uh, hungerness is the number one force of creativity, guys. So, uh, any questions? Um, I just wanted to add a point. So right now you're using like Twitter and Facebook. The problem with it's a great start and like this is a worthwhile initiative. Don't get me wrong, because we don't like Uber taking the fees and the restrictions. But like Facebook or Twitter could just censor the hashtag need a ride or the means of doing this ride sharing in this sense. The most ideal way of facilitating it would be if it was fully integrated into something like the Ethereum blockchain where it was censorship resistant and fully integrated with crypto tokens. So we're not there quite yet, but this is a really great initiative and social hack that embodies a lot of decentralization principles. So. Yeah, no, I did. I did mention that. I did mention that on the. I did mention that on the on the initial on the initial video. But, but uh, I just want to finish up. I just want to finish up. Remember, guys, even Bitcoin started as a published paper on some public Reddit depository, right? And uh, this is the same way. Uh, History re repeat itself. Right. So yes, the 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 application is coming out. Is it will be fully uh, censorship resistant out there for everybody. Thank you. Yeah.